اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المظلومين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه ورواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance and the return of the master, the savior, the avenger Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala My dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Tonight is truly special on multiple levels It is in a way a station in our journey into the afterlife. There has to be accountability tonight. There has to be a degree of introspection. Each of us has to look at their track record, their rap sheet. We have to examine how we've been leading our lives up to this point. One of the blessings we could never show enough gratitude for, we could never be thankful sufficiently for, is the fact that no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, I've been led to come to a gathering in which believers have come together to pray. They've come together to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've come together to apologize once and for all. How many times have we been in this position before where we have turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
with sincerity. If I doubt someone's intentions, someone's devotion, it would be mine. But how many times have I actually sat here or in gatherings like this and said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm sorry, I apologize. I won't live my life the same way again. How many times have we been afflicted with tragedies, problems, insurmountable difficulties, at which point we have said, I apologize, I'll be a better person. I'll be the way you want me to be. And yet, soon after that, we end up falling into the same satanic traps. We end up making the same mistakes, same blunders. Isn't it enough? Isn't it time I say to myself, have some shame. You've apologized. If someone hurts you, and then came back and apologized, but hurt you again and came back and apologized and hurt you the third time and came back and said they're sorry. At some point you're gonna say, you're not being sincere, you're not honest. Your apologies don't mean anything. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves a servant of His who makes an error, who commits a sin, only to then come back on the night of Qadr and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done, done that. I acknowledge my mistakes. I confess to my crimes. I apologize. But brothers and sisters, the problem we have is that we are faced with an inevitable reality that comes knocking without asking us for permission and that's death. We don't know whether we're going to be alive this time next year. We don't know whether at the time of our death we will have made amends and corrected our mistakes and apologized. We don't know any of that, which is why we come here tonight. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah bless you all. May Allah forgive the sins of this insubordinate slave, my own crimes. Merely because I happen to be with you tonight, we've been given yet another chance. Let's make the most of this. Let's ensure that if death comes our way tomorrow, that we're ready, that at least we've made amends, that we've expressed our sincere remorse, that we have acknowledged our sins, that we've asked Allah for forgiveness. Let's make sure of that tonight. Let's make sure that when we repent to God, we do so in a serious manner. Let's not make a mockery of God. Traditions say the person who commits sins over and over and over again, and yet keeps apologizing, keeps asking for repentance, that person is making a mockery of God. And that's much worse than committing the sin itself. When I don't take God seriously, when He tells me to do something and I conveniently turn the other way and not pay any attention to Him, let's not make a mockery of God. Let's not make a mockery of ourselves. Death is coming. There is no question. Everyone around you will die. Everyone you love will die. And you will also die. One day they'll put some cotton in my mouth and wrap me with my shroud. And then if I'm lucky, there will be believers who will come to my funeral and carry this body into my grave. Have you seen the inside of a grave? Have you seen how horrific it is? Just the thought of being left there, lonely, helpless, not having anyone from among your family, anyone among your circle of friends, your loved ones, just leaving you there. Traditions say 
that your own family who love and cherish you with every fiber of their being, they will only stay with you until you are lowered into that pit, six feet under. They'll probably stick around for another half an hour, maybe an hour, maybe if you have a parent or a child who's been raised well, who actually loves you, might stick around and read a chapter from the Holy Qur'an, but then they'll go back to their lives and they'll forget all about you. One hadith says that after a person dies and is taken to their grave and buried, the angel of death then comes and he carries a handful of dust. What that dust is, I have no clue. But the Prophet says that the angel of death will then sprinkle this dust into the faces of the family of the deceased and that will make them forget the person. What will I do when I'm forgotten even by my dear loved ones? What would I, what would I say? What will I say? What will I do? When I am left with nothing but my own actions to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not some earthly judge who convicts me or exonerates me based on physical, tangible evidence that's presented to him. This is God, the one who knows. He knows every little thing I've done. He knows every thought that's passed through my mind. What will I do there? Tonight, brothers and sisters, let's pay some close attention. Tonight is a rehearsal of our death. That's what it is, in a nutshell. Amirul Mu'mineen, whose martyrdom we commemorate tonight, he says, Mutu qabla an tamutu. Die before your actual death comes. In other words, rehearse your death. Think about the moment just before your death. Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourselves to account before you are held to account. There's a big difference. Those of you who run a business know what I'm talking about. There's a difference between you going through your accounts, making sure there are no discrepancies, no problems, no flaws, no crimes have been committed and you being audited by the tax man. Because when the tax man comes knocking at your door, they will leave nothing, no stone will be left unturned. They will go through every penny that's gone in or out of your account. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, do yourselves a favor. Hasibu anfusakum. Hold yourselves to account before you are held to account by the one who knows every single detail. At least try and prepare for your death. Tonight that's exactly what we're aiming to do. When you sit there and you address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beseech Him by the glory and majesty of His book and by his majestic name, Bika Ya Allah, Bika Ya Allah. And you say that 10 times. Then you mention the names of the people who were most beloved to the heart of Allah. Muhammad and Al Muhammad. You mention them by name, one after the other. When you sit there and speak to God, imagine yourself standing before Him, being held to account, being judged. The difference between tonight and our death is that tonight once we beseech God, we pray, we beg, we grovel, we cry. After all that, Allah gives us another chance. He says, okay, prove yourself. Let's see what you're made of. Let's see if you're a man or woman of your word. Whereas when we're dead, there is no second chance. al Amalun wala hisab, the Imam says, in this world you have action without accountability. Even the problems that we face in this life, they're not the consequences of our actions in terms of God's retribution or chastisement or punishment. 
No, 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 no. The problems we face in this world are direct physical manifestations of our actions. اليوم عمل ولا حساب وغدا حساب ولا عمل Tomorrow in the afterlife there is accountability but there is no action. Meaning you can't fix any of the mistakes that you've made. That's why tonight it's customary for believers to talk to each other, to send messages, to make phone calls and ask each other for forgiveness. Because you won't get this chance after you're dead. Someone that you've hurt or, let me put it this way, someone who has hurt you. You did nothing to hurt them. They hurt you. Give them a call and say, if I've hurt you, I'm sorry. Because tonight we're rehearsing our death. Tonight we're trying to catch a glimpse of what it feels like to be at the moment of death except we have a chance. That is how merciful God is. He's given us yet another chance. Two nights ago I spoke about an individual that Amir al-Mu'mineen addresses as his own brother. If you haven't listened to the lecture, go back and listen. The Imam says that what made this person great in my eyes was the fact that he saw this world as so little so peripheral, so trivial, so worthless. That's what made him great in the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The question here is, how can we look at this world as a petty object, as something that's not worth investing heavily into, not worth wasting our lives and our time and our effort and our minds into? How do we do that? Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ فَإِنَّ مَنْ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ هَانَتْ عَلَيْهِ الدُّنْيَا Remember death. Constantly try and remind yourself of the inevitable conclusion that you will reach. Not your parents, not your family, not your friends, but you yourself will be carried in a casket one day. For some of us, that's sooner than others. Have you ever been to a cemetery? Have you read the tombstones, the inscriptions on the tombstones? Even though it's not recommended to do that, but when I visit cemeteries, I tend to do that. And I look for something specific, not the names of the individuals, because those people are now in front of their creator. The one thing I look at is their age. Have you seen how old people are in the cemetery? We think because we're surrounded by people who are older than us, the younger individuals often feel that they have their whole lives ahead of them. Isn't that true? Well, take a trip to the cemetery. Read the inscriptions on the tombstones. You'll see people in there. 20s, people in their 30s. There's often a section of the cemetery that's allocated to infants and children. We're not talking about stillborn infants. We're talking about the three-year-old and the five-year-old and the 10-year-old. And so don't be fooled by statistics. Don't think that just because you're at the age of 15 or 16 or 20, and we, mashallah, have so many young people in the audience tonight. But don't think just because you happen to be young now that you still have time. You have time to make mistakes and you have time to, at some point down the line, make amends and correct those mistakes. It's something that I used to hear. I'm not sure if this is a prevalent problem. But I remember hearing from people saying that if somebody wants to wear the hijab and she happens to be young, often people around her would tell her, you're still so young. What are you doing wearing the hijab now? You're only 16 and 17 and 20. God forbid she wants to wear the hijab at the age of, age of seven or eight or nine. You're still young. You can wait until you go to 
you, you, you graduate, you get married, you have kids, then you go to Hajj. Then when you come back from Hajj, then you have the chance to put on the hijab. What are you thinking? How distracted are we? How preoccupied are we with this dunya? That we keep putting things off, we keep procrastinating when it comes to our values, to our principles, to the teachings and instructions of Allah. When it comes to the worldly things, we don't want to procrastinate. We won't put anything off. We want it and we want it now. But when it comes to the akhara, when it comes to religion, when it comes to faith, suddenly we have no issues delaying and delaying and delaying. And for many people, that day never actually comes. Because sudden deaths are so normal now. People have a heart attack, people who suffer from cardiovascular anomalies. They fall down and die in an instant, no warning, nothing. How many times have you heard about family members and friends and friends of friends who die without being sick? And even the doctors in their death certificate, what they want to mention, the cause of their death, they simply say heart attack. Well, what caused the heart attack? No one knows. They could be perfectly healthy one day and then dead the next. One of the maraja' and ulama, he told me the story. He says that I was in the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and I was standing there and there were some people around me, one of whom was his young sister. At the time she must have been 16 years old. May Allah give you a long life of service to the Ahlul Bayt But death comes without knocking. He says, I was standing next to my young sister. An old man passed next to us in the courtyard of the shrine of Imam al Hussein. He was visibly old. All his hair had turned gray. And so when he walked past us, he said, my sister told me, he said, I can smell the halwa from his fatiha. In other words, it's about time this person dies. Look at him, he's so old. 16 year old makes a comment. He said the next day, literally 24 hours later, he said, I stood in the same courtyard of Imam al Hussein. That old man was standing behind me and we performed Salat al Mayyit on my sister's dead body. The next day, he said, I shivered. When I noticed the old man behind me, I said, Subhanallah. Yesterday, she said, this man should have been dead already. And today she's the one, 16 years old. And the old man's praying Salatul Mayyit for her. Sallu ala Muhammad wa <clears throat> Amir al muminin says, Udhkuru hadim al laddhat wa mushattit al jama'at. Remember the thing that completely eviscerates desires. When you feel an urge to commit an act of sin, <clears throat> when you're about to engage in something that you know to be immoral and unethical and wrong, Remember death. Death destroys that desire instantaneously. It turns every temptation into something that's bitter. The way Amir al muminin speaks about death is in a manner that you know this person is fully prepared for it. He's embraced it. Inshallah, we'll talk a little bit about that later. He says, remember the thing that will disperse all gatherings. You're sitting, sitting around your friends, your family, you're happy, you're delighted. Death is, what was, is what's going to disperse all of that. 
And the one that pushes, wishes and desires so far away and brings close the moment of our departure. مُبَعَدَ الْأُمْنِيَاتِ وَمُقَرِّبَ الْمَنِيَّاتِ Imam says, remember this thing. What is it, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen? It's death. Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam was once walking, he came across an open grave. It was dug up and ready to receive its inhabitant. The Imam looked at that grave. He might have quoted Amir al Mu'mineen, but regardless, Kullukum Nurun Wahid. The Imam saw the inside of that grave. He made a statement. I want you to remember this. He said, Ma kana hada akhiruh kana haqiqan ayyuzhada fi awwalih. If a journey ends with this being thrown into a pit in the ground, to become food for worms. If a journey ends with this, then you should really be not attached to the beginning of this journey. Because it'll all end here. So what's the point? What's the point of wasting our lives? What's the point of investing too much? Then the Imam made another st statement even more terrifying. He said, a journey that begins with this Horrific place. You should truly be terrified of the end of this journey. If it begins with this. In one hadith, the Imam says, You wish to be an ascetic, someone who has the quality of zuhd, someone who's careless about this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his prophet, he says, you want to be like that? Do two things. Number one, constantly remember death. And number two, don't save up too much. Most people fall into sin because they feel what they have is not enough. So they need to save up. They need to buy that next big thing. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a savings account for a rainy day and so on. But this idea that I don't have enough, I should save up. I don't have such and such, I need to get it. And I need to work. And I need to come, come up with more money. And I need to do this and I need to do that. Most people fall into sin because of that. I've mentioned this example before. A woman by the name of Abigail Disney. She's the heiress of the Disney empire. You know the Walt Disney empire? One of the means of disseminating pure evil today, the Disney empire, with their movies and their cartoons, and all of the immoral lessons that they teach to our children. And we are so oblivious. We're so stupid, sitting down thinking, oh, my children are watching cartoons. Cartoons surely are harmless. She's the heiress of this empire. So her parents were billionaires. She inherited all of that money. They did an interview with her. She mentioned some really interesting points about wealth and what it does to you and what it did to her own family. But one of the points she makes is a reference to a study. She says that they went to a group of individuals who were wealthy because they inherited great sums from their families. So they weren't self-made entrepreneurs. They inherited a lot of money. They were heirs to other empires, people like her. So they went and asked these people a specific question, which was, how much money do you think you should have before you retire? Before you think I've had enough? Before you stop working, how much do you think is enough? So they each gave a random number. One of them said a hundred million, another said 50 million, another said a billion dollars, another said 600 million. The numbers were very disparate, they were different. There was no specific theme, no, no, no consistent number. So they were confused. They went back and asked the follow-up question, which was how much money did you inherit from your family? 
and they came to the realization that the numbers those people had given earlier were, were double the amount of money they had in inherited from their family. So if a person had inherited 50 million, he said, I would need 100 million to retire. If a person had inherited 200 million, they would say, I need 400 million before I retire. In other words, it's never enough. It's not based on what they need. It's based on an insatiable desire that can never be satisfied. Imam al-Sadiq provides the most beautiful illustration of this dunya when he says that the dunya, this world of ours, is like sea water, salt water. What happens when you drink salt water? The more you drink, the thirstier you become. In fact, they say that for every liter of salt water that a person consumes, they need two liters of fresh water just to process the salt water. So if you drink a liter, you'll become thirstier. You'll then drink another liter. You're even thirstier until you die of thirst. Imam al-Sadiq says, that's the dunya. So stop. Stop. Why are you in such a hurry? Slow down a bit. Hit the brakes. Think about more existential issues. More important things. Think about your akhirah. Think about the mistakes that you make consistently and over and over again. Think about the sins that you're mired with, that you're sinking in. I'm speaking to myself once again. I see myself as someone who's sinking, someone who's drowning. And someone who's drown drowning, what are they supposed to do? Call out for help. That's what we do tonight. That's why when you read the dua and you say, Bika ya Allah, bi Muhammadin, bi Ali, and bi Fatimata, scream your lungs out because you're someone who's drowning. Again, I'm speaking to myself. You're drowning. You gotta ask for, your, for help. You gotta scream for help. Anyway, tonight is a special night because playtime is over. I have to get out of this deep slumber. My blissful ignorance has to come to an end. I need to wake up. I need to realize that the path that I'm on is a self-destructive one. Let me correct that path. Let me try and get closer to Ali ibn Abi Talib, to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Let me start asking whenever I'm about to do something, would Amir al-Mu'mineen like it for me to do this or not? Would Fatima to Zahra be pleased? Would the Imam, would the Imam of my time be pleased or not? Whatever it is, no matter how small a step you're taking, ask this question. Let's get closer to them because playtime is over. That's one reason tonight is so special. The other reason, my dear brothers and sisters, is that just as one Quran is being, is being revealed tonight and descending from the heavens to the earth. Another Quran is ascending from the earth towards the heavens. Just as the book of Allah was revealed on this night and sent down to the earth, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al Quran al Natiq, the spoken Quran is about to depart from this world. It's the night of the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen. As I said, Ali ibn Abi Talib was a person who fully absorbed the reality of this world, the reality of this dunya, and the significance of the remembrance of death. That was why the Imam was so careless towards this world. To him, it didn't matter. They told Amir al-Mu'mineen that a person has built a two-story house. The Imam said, Inna amalahu la tawil. He has such grand aspirations. This person seems to think that he is going to live on this earth for a lengthy time. He's built two stories. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the one who would stand in prayer. 
one of the companions says that I was watching the Imam, he was isolated. The Imam would spend all his days digging up wells for those who perform Hajj, such that today when you go to Hajj, they will bring you a bottle of water on which there is a label that says Abiyaru Aliyin Sallallahu Alaihi Ya Abul Hasan. 14 centuries, people have been drinking from water that's extracted from wells that you dug up. He would plant palm trees for the poor individuals, poor families to come and eat from those dates. And then after he'd finished planting each tree and digging the wells, the Imam would stand there in the farm and he would perform Salatul Layl. One of the companions says, I came across him. I heard his voice. So I hid behind one of the bushes, one of the trees, and I began to observe Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Imam began to pray. He started to cry out of fear. Fear from his actions. Fear from the idea that he might have committed something that would violate the sanctity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he was sinless, he was inerrant. He cried and cried and cried and shivered and shook until he fell unconscious. He said, I came to him, I tried to shake him and he was so stiff as a wooden piece of plank. He said, I thought the Imam had died. So I ran towards his home. I knocked on the door. Fatima to Zahra came out. I said to her, Ya bint Rasulillah, a'zam Allahu lak al ajr fi Abi al-Hasan. May Allah increase your reward. Condolences to you. Your husband has just died. She said, how? What did you see? So he told her the story. She said, oh, that's what he does every single night. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Zayn al-Abideen is called Zayn al-Abideen because his prayer, his supplications were unlike any other. And yet one day they told him, you pray like this. You don't cease, you don't stop. The Imam said, Aina antum min salat wa ibadati Amir al muminin You're not aware of how Amir al muminin used to worship Allah. You think I'm a worshiper? Subhanallah, I'll mention this as well. One day, someone came to Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein in the time of Imam al Hassan's Imamah. So, this was a time when Iraq was an affluent country. It was rather rich, there weren't too many poor people, agriculture was good, and so people were making a decent and comfortable life for themselves. So, this person comes to Imam al Hassan. He sees that the Imam is breaking his fast with vinegar and a piece of bread. Vinegar and bread. He said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, Ya Aba Muhammad, why do you eat this? Look at other people, they're eating meat and they're eating all kinds of dishes and you're just eating this. He said to him, then you're not aware of my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. One day, a man came to Kufa. This is at a time when Ali ibn Abi Talib was the emperor of 50 of today's nations. Almost a quarter, maybe a third of the entire planet was under the reign of Ali. He came to Kufa. Again, Kufa was affluent. Kufa was a town of hundreds of thousands of people, each of whom had his own house. They were eating good food. Amir al-Mu'mineen made sure of it. In one statement, the Imam ascends the pulpit. He makes a very brief statement. It was almost like a State of the Union address. The Imam said that since I have become your Imam, your Khalifa, I have ensured that people are not hungry and that everyone owns their home and that people drink clean water. Wassalam, he got off the pulpit. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a lot of enemies, and yet none of them, none, 
got up and said, no, that's not true. I'm hungry. I don't have a home. No one. Not even Muawiyah. Not even people who came after him. Allahu Akbar. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the country that he ran. And yet someone comes to Kufa. He says, well, if people are this affluent and people are living comfortable lives, let's go to the Khalifa's home. Surely his food is even better than that. So he came and said, Ya Amir al muminin could I be your guest tonight? The Imam said, of course. Imagine the king, the emperor, the president. You could be his guest. The Imam said, come to my home. He went to his home. The Imam brought him whatever was available at the time. And then he sat to eat his own food. He didn't eat with his guests. His own food, the guest narrate the story, narrates the story. His name's mentioned in history. He says that the Imam went and he pulled out a vase. On this vase, there was a layer of clay that had dried up and the Imam had put had, his official seal on the clay. Why do people do that? They do it so you don't unseal the vase, so you don't open it. He has his own seal, his own stamp. If anyone tampered with it, the Imam would know. He said, the Imam opened it. I thought there must be something exotic in this. He opened it and pulled out a piece of dry barley bread that had almost gone sour. He said, the sour stench of the bread made me sick. So he said, I didn't say anything to the Imam. That was his food. Instead, I went to the servant of Amir al-Mu'mineen. My words, not his. He said, don't you have any faith in God? Have you no religion? What is wrong with you people? Why do you let this old man eat this kind of food? And he's the Khalifa. The servant said to him, don't blame me. The Imam has made a covenant. He's made us promise him. And I can't break a promise. Subhanallah. Not that if they did something, if they disobeyed Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Imam would punish them. He said, if we disobey the Imam, he will release us. The Imams had slaves, yes. But all of those slaves volunteered to be at the service of the Ahlul Bayt. He said, I don't want the Imam to release me, to set me free. I don't want to break a promise that I made to him. They've said that on one occasion, one of the slaves, the Imam let him go. He probably broke a promise or he did something that was inappropriate, whatever the case was. The Imam let him go, or maybe he just released him. As Imam Zain al-Abideen used to do, the Imam would buy slaves and keep them for a year, train them, teach them, allow them to observe his prayers, his supplications, his invocations. Then on the day of Eid al-Fitr, the Imam would release them all. It was the Ahlul Bayt who abolished slavery. It was the Imams alayhim salam who set the stage for slavery to come to an end. So on one of these occasions, the Imam set one of the slaves free. The slave came back to him. He said, what have I done? Why would you set me free? Why are you letting me go? Why don't you let me be in your presence? So this man said to the slave, he said, why don't you show some mercy to this old man? He said, no, he's promised us not to open this seal. In another hadith, he says that I said to the Imam himself, another person says, I told him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, why do you do this? You seal the vessel that you put your food in, your dry barley bread that you have to break on your own knees. Ali ibn Abi Talib, who single handedly plucked open the gates of Khaybar, has to break that piece of bread on his knees. He said, I told him, Ya Amir al muminin why do you put this seal on the vessel? He said, because my son Imam al Hassan feels sorry for me. And if I don't put a seal, he'll probably come and lather the bread with some oil 
and I don't want that to happen. Sallallahu alayka ya Abu al-Hasan. Amir al-Mu'mineen was like this. One day, they brought him a drink. In Arabic, they call it falu dhaj. In Farsi, they call it falu deh. Which might have been a mixture of some honey, rose water. It, it, it has a, a distinctive taste. It tastes beautiful and it even smells. It has a really nice fragrance. They brought that drink, they put it in front of the, the Imam. The Imam smelt it. People looked at the Imam, waiting for him to pick it up and drink it. He didn't. So then they said to him, Awatuharimuha ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Do you think of this? Do you consider this to be haram? Should we also avoid drinking it? He said, No, I'm not saying it's haram. But I won't drink it Lianna Habibi Rasulullah. Because my beloved messenger of God never drank from this. And I don't want to taste the sweetness of a blessing of this dunya that Rasulullah never tasted. Amir al Mu'mineen would follow the example of the Holy Messenger. I don't know if you've ever, ever observed or seen in these nature documentaries. A small calf in the company of its mother, the she-camel. When the camel walks on the desert dunes, the calf will put its feet in the exact same spot as its mother. The calf doesn't know which direction to take, doesn't know if it's going to fall into something that's dangerous or fall off a cliff. And so the calf will put its feet in the same exact position as its mother's feet. Rasul, Amir al muminin says, this is how I followed Rasulullah. Whatever Rasulullah did, I do. Whatever Rasulullah didn't do, I refrain from, even if it's drinking something that's nice. That's how he, em he emulated Rasulullah. Except for one thing. The Imam didn't follow the example of Rasulullah. Do you know what it was? They came to Amir al muminin on several occasions. They said to him, Ya Amir al muminin you're almost 62, 63 years old. Your hair has gone gray. Rasulullah used to dye his hair. Why don't you also dye your hair? It's recommended, it's mustahab. Amir al muminin used to say no. Why Ya Amir al muminin That's the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. He said, because Rasulullah himself told me, that soon you will dye your beard with the blood that gushes from your head. Allahu Akbar. And so I'm waiting for that day. It's as if Rasulullah was telling me not to dye your hair. It'll be dyed with your own blood one day. Subhanallah. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. No matter how much we talk about him, we'll never not me, not the greatest scholars, not the most lofty erudites, not the best authors, not the best poets. No one will be able to present Ali ibn Abi Talib in a way that we begin to appreciate him. This is all the tip of the iceberg. Listen to this hadith. Qala Rasulullah. صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم من أراد أن ينظر إلى آدم وعلمه whoever wishes to see Adam and his knowledge ومن أراد أن ينظر إلى نوح وعزمه whoever wishes to see نوح and his commitment the knowledge of Adam. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah taught Adam everything. Adam then taught the angels. Whoever wants to see Adam and his knowledge. Whoever wants to see Nuh and his commitment. 950 years of preaching to his people. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَخِلَّتِهِ Whoever wishes to see Ibrahim, and his 
intimate friendship with Allah. Ibrahim is called Khalilullah. Ibrahim had to pass through so many tests before he became the intimate friend of God. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ وَبَطْشِهِ The bravery and the strength of Musa is legendary. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ عِيسَىٰ وَحِلْمِهِ Whoever wants to see Jesus and his forbearance and forgiveness وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَأَخْلَاقِهِ اللهم صل على محمد وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَخُلُقِهِ Whoever wants to see the Prophet himself and his demeanor and his conduct and his akhlaq fal yanzur ila Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad should look at none other than Ali who says this? Rasulullah in which book? Al-Kafi? Al-Bihar? Basair al-Darajat? Shia sources? No! Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his book Fadail al-Sahaba the book that I mentioned a couple of nights ago on the 19th of the holy month of Ramadan two volumes one dedicated to all the other companions one dedicated to Ali exclusively a Sunni scholar and jurist mentions this hadith this is Ali ibn Abi Talib and so we have no recourse, brothers and sisters, than to turn to Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam al Kazim has a dua in which he asks Allah for forgiveness. And he does so in different ways. And he speaks for about a page. Then the Imam at the end, he says, Ilahi, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I don't have anything to offer you. I don't have much in the way of good deeds and whatnot. And I am burdened with sin. But you have said in your own book, يَوْمَ نَأْتِي كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ Oh Allah, you said that on the day of judgment, every group will come with their imam. So make me one of the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Make him my imam. So that on the day of judgment, instead of looking at me, you look at my Imam and say, I forgive you. As long as we don't do something that would push us out of the companionship and fellowship of Amir al Mu'mineen, as long as we don't do things that would bring shame to Amir al Mu'mineen, maybe our last chance is that on the day of judgment, we will come with him, we will hide behind him, we will ride on his coattails. We'll try and hide, hide ourselves and say, Ilahi, this is my Imam. Amiri Husaynun wa Ni'am al Amir. As Amr ibn Janada said on the day of Ashura, instead of identifying himself, I've said this to young people all over the world. I've said, try and memorize this statement. Instead of saying who he is, who his father is, who his family is, this is what I've done, these are my achievements, my accomplishments. Instead of all that, he identifies himself with his Imam. He said, Amiri Husaynun wa Ni'm al Amir. Surur Fuad al Bashir al Nadir. Aliun wa Fatimatun walidah. Fahal ta'lamun alahum al Nadir. My master is Hussein. My master is Ali. I mentioned the story a couple of nights ago. I want to finish it. There's a very important ending which I didn't. I, I didn't mention, I left it for tonight. The story of the man who ate from food that was prepared for Rasulullah. I mentioned that when the Holy Prophet got back from Khaybar, the Messenger of Allah conquered the fortress. Then he went back to Medina. When he arrived in Medina, Al-Allamatul Majlisi narrates this hadith in Bihar al-Anwar. 
He says, a woman came to him. She said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I made another avow that if you got back safely, I would cook this meal for you. I'm just going through the story very quickly to reach the conclusion. So I've prepared this food for you. It was the thigh of a sheep. It was well cooked and presented to the Holy Prophet. So Rasulullah called 10 of his companions who included Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ammar, Abu Dhar, Salman, Al-Maqdad, Suhaib, Ar-Rumi, Bilal al-Habashi. They all came, 10 of them. Just as the Prophet was about to eat, something happened that required the Prophet's attention. The Prophet got up. So this man, he, after the Prophet left, he extended his hand to eat from the meal. Remember that story? Amir al-Mu'mineen said to him, he said, listen, wait until the Prophet comes back. He said to the Imam, Rasulallah. Why are you being stingy? Do you think the Prophet is stingy? The hadith says that this man whose name was Al-Barra, he was Arabi, means that he was a Bedouin. He probably didn't understand the etiquettes. He wasn't a well-disciplined individual. So the Imam said to him, no, it's not that I'm being stingy, but it's out of respect for Rasulullah that we wait for him and take the first bite. So he didn't listen to the Imam. He grabbed a bite, put it in his mouth. The Prophet came back. He began twisting and turning because of the stomach ache that he had developed. Now, the conclusion which is important is this. The Prophet came back. This person was almost on the brink of death. Rasulullah said, what happened? They told him that he had taken a bite. The Prophet taught them a prayer. He said, say with me, Bismillah al-Kafi, Bismillah al-Shafi, Bismillah al-Mu'afi, Bismillah al-Ladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama'a. Bismillah, they started eating. The hadith says that the food began to speak to Rasulullah. It said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I'm poisoned. Perhaps another version of the hadith is that Jibra'il told the Prophet this food was poisoned, which is why Al-Barra fell sick and was about to die. So the Prophet called the woman who brought the food. He said to her, I know you poisoned the food. Tell me why. She said, okay. Some of my family members were in Khaybar, including my husband, my brother, and my father. Some have said that this woman is the sister of Marhab, the one killed and slain at the hands of Amir al mumineen She said, when I heard that you had killed my brothers, I said, I will poison this man, I will kill him. If he happens to be just another king, then he will die and I will rid the world of him. But if he's truly a prophet, then God will warn him and he won't die. So I said to everyone, I will serve the food to this person, to the Holy Prophet that is. If he survives, then he's truly a prophet. If he dies, then he's a liar. Now that you've survived, I believe that you are a prophet of God and she recited the testimony of faith and became a Muslim. What happened later is what's crucial. Al-Barra died. They came to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, would you come and perform Salatul Mayyit on your companion? The Holy Prophet said, no. Jibra'il told me not to pray on this man because of what he did to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, this man was joking. When he told Amir al muminin you're being stingy, he wasn't serious. The Prophet said, Law kana mujiddan. I know he's joking. If he had been serious, in the comment that he made to Ali ibn Abi Talib, لَحَبَطَ كُلُّ عَمَلِهِ All of his deeds would have been destroyed. All I'm saying is because he joked about it, I won't pray upon him. Let someone else pray. So they insisted. The Holy Prophet said, okay. I will only pray over him if Ali ibn Abi Talib comes and forgives him. Imam Ali had gone to Masjid Qiba. So they waited. Amir al-Mu'mineen came back from Masjid Qiba 
As soon as the Imam arrived, he saw the body of Al-Barra. The Imam said to him, Rahimakallah ayyuha Al-Barra. May Allah bestow your mercy upon you. You were a good man. Amir al muminin had no hard feelings for him or the comment that he made. He said, may Allah bless you and forgive your sins. You were a good man. Rasulullah then said, now that Ali ibn Abi Talib has prayed for him, you should know that had it not been for the fact that Salatul Janazah is wajib, that prayer would have been sufficient for Barra. I wouldn't even have to pray upon him. But since Salatul Janazah is wajib, Ali ibn Abi Talib has prayed for him, I will perform the Salah. The Prophet went, he performed the Salah, then he went and gave condolences to his family. Listen to this. He went to the family of Barra. He said to them, Ya Ahla Barra, Antum bitahniyati awla man at ta'ziyah. O family of Barra, I should congratulate you instead of giving you condolences. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we've lost a husband, we've lost a son, we've lost a father. Why congratulate us? The Prophet said, because Ali ibn Abi Talib prayed for Barra. And because he prayed for him, God revealed to me that had the sins of Barra been the same amount as every morsel and every grain of sand on the earth, I would have forgiven all of them because of the prayer of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then the Prophet looked at his companions. He said, Ya Ashabi, O oh my companions, Ta'arradu li du'a'i Ali lakum. Do things so that Ali would pray for you. Wala ta'arradu li du'a'i Ali alaykum. And never do something. Ya Mu'mineen, my dear brothers and sisters, let's not do anything that would make Amir al-Mu'mineen make a prayer against us. Now, tonight, what do we say? How can we get Amir al-Mu'mineen to pray for us?